I'm ready for the word tonight. I'm excited about the word tonight. Hopefully you are too, to hear what the Lord has to say to us. I want you to get into your mind a cup, and then we're going to ask the Lord to fill that cup with the word, with living word, that will be infectual and change and bring transformation to us. Amen. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul. Bread from heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Oh, holy and most gracious Father, Father, we just thank you for the word on tonight. Father, I decrease, Lord, that you would increase. God, I thank you that when I open my mouth, you will fill it. Lord, I thank you that you will meet us at our level of need, that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. So, God, I thank you that with praise and worship, our minds are alert, our ears are open, and our hearts are receptive to what you will plant, that it will bring life and light into our life and every life we touch. And everyone agreed and said, amen. If you're watching via podcast, vidcast, YouTube, however you're watching, Come down to Living Word Bible Church, and we will save you a hug, a high five, or a handshake. We'll make you feel just like family. Amen, everybody? Amen. So tonight, we're going to be talking about living intentionally. And a couple of years ago, the Lord just awakened me to the fact that when the Word says that the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered by the Lord, that I would have an opportunity to choose to allow him to order my steps and begin to live intentionally. Now, what that looks like is that so many times there are many of us who just allow life to happen. I had that experience maybe when I was in my 20s, a little bit when I was in my 30s. My 40s have been amazing. I'm about to exit the 40s, but the 40s have been fantastic because I think I finally woke up. When I was 20, my head was on sideways. I was up to all kinds of shenanigans and tomfoolery. I know y'all can't connect to that. You just have to listen to it from me and what I used to do because this is the blessed house with the good people and y'all wasn't doing no shenanigans and no tomfoolery. But my 20s, that's all that represented. And then I got to Living Word Bible Church when I was around 30. My oldest was about two, uh, two and a half, and my, my youngest was four weeks old. My mom had been coming to Living Word Bible Church and prayed for me for six years years to come to this church because I'm stubborn and I'm hard-headed, or at least I was. I'm not anymore because now when the Lord speaks, I'm just, Lord, just tell me where to go. Amen, somebody? And so living intentionally means you just don't allow life to happen. You have a plan and you allow the Lord to order your steps. So that means you want to go to Starbucks to get coffee, but maybe the Lord tells you don't go to the Starbucks by your house, but you feel an unction inside of you to go to a different Starbucks. And at the different Starbucks that may be a mile outside of your normal path is your assignment that's waiting for you because you're living intentionally and you get to give someone that gift of encouragement or love or mercy or grace. You get to do something that impacts the love of God and pours it into their life. Amen. So living intentionally means that you cannot just look at everything from a linear uh, viewpoint. You have to begin to kind of look at your life almost from an aerial view. You got to live life at a higher altitude. Amen. Because when you live it in a higher altitude, then you can see how God can strategically use you everywhere you go. We live at uh, Higley and Ray, and there is a gas station right by there. And it is in the opposite direction from where I need to go when I'm on my way to church. But there are times when the Lord will tell me, you need gas. I'm like, well, I don't need to get gas right now, but who argues with the Holy Spirit? It's just a polite conversation. I'm still going to yield and do what he tells me to do. Amen. Don't get all worked up. But he'll tell me, and I'm like, but I don't need gas right now. He's like, go get gas. So I'll go get gas. And sure enough, I'll meet someone maybe behind the counter. There's a lady there who might be on her shift right now. I'm not going to say her name, but she's come to know me as the lady that prays. Because the first time I met her, I said, how are you doing? She goes, oh, it's such a hard day. It's a long day. We've had so many customers. They've been so nasty. And I said, well, you know, God loves you. And she just kind of stopped ringing up. I think I was getting a Coke and some gas. She just stopped and she looked at me. She's like, what did you say? I said, God loves you. I said, and I'm a praying woman, so I'll be praying for you that today will be a great day for the rest of your day. And you will remember the black lady who sounded crazy talking about Jesus, but you will be talking about me when I walk away. And let me tell you guys something. See, when Jesus showed up on a scene, people were talking about him when he walked away. 
because you couldn't help but interact with Jesus and have something to converse about after he left the scene. So we want to be like Jesus, right? So in our being Christ-like and being like Jesus, people should be talking about us when we walk away. And I don't care if they're saying, oh, there's that lady who she is always talking about Jesus. If that's how you know me, praise the Lord. That's that lady with that phone case that says, keep calm and trust God. Everywhere I go, I take that phone case and I turn it so the person can see it. And I try not to make it obvious that that's what I'm doing. But that is what I'm doing. Because that's my evangelism tool. And sometimes it sparks a conversation. You need to have opportunities to live intentionally so that you are sparking conversations for Christ. Amen. Now, I know this is a young crowd in here, so I'm going to date myself. So some of y'all mature Christians, y'all going to know what I'm talking about. Remember the song, K Sera Sera? Do you remember the artist? Doris Day. Whoever said Doris Day, we in the same house. Doris Day. And it meant whatever will be, will be. And I hear people say, well, sometimes things happen for a reason. What if the reason is awful? What if the reason wasn't just what if the reason wasn't what God had in store but we come in a, we live in a fallen world and we have an enemy so sometimes he has a reason for doing things but then God because he promises to work all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose sometimes it gets assigned in his column because he cleaned it up but that's not how it works sometimes the enemy sends us a mess sometimes our friends send us a mess sometimes we create the mess all by ourselves but God is such a merciful God that when we make a big mess, God gets two pails, one for him and one for you, because he doesn't leave you to clean up your mess by yourself. That's what his mercy and his grace is all about. Amen. So it's not a good way to live that whatever will be will be. I don't want to live a life of reaction. I want to live a life responding and choosing how I'm going to respond. So we got three little things that we're going to talk about tonight. The first one I need you to do, turn to your neighbor and say, stop stealing. Now, right when you hear that or when I say that, you may say, oh, she's talking about money. She's talking about the tithes. She's talking about don't steal from God. I believe in tithing. If you don't, I support your free right to make the wrong decision, so I'm not even touching tithing. But I'll tell you like this, this is just a public service announcement. It ain't got nothing to do with the word. You either tithing it in the house or you tithing outside of the house of the enemy because the enemy will snatch that money right up out your hand. And the Lord can do so much more with it when you bring it with a cheerful heart. Amen. Public service announcement that will hit you in the parking lot when you're on your way home. That's not even what I'm talking about. When I talk about stop cursing or stop stealing, when I say stop stealing, what I mean is when you are supposed to give your burdens, your cares, your anxieties, your, your, your doubts, your unbelief, all of that you're supposed to give it to God, right? What does the Bible tell us to do? You'll see it up in the scriptures. It says in 1 Peter 5, 7, give all. Last time I checked, all still means all. Whether you look at it in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, it's all. Give all your worries and cares to God. Why? For he cares about you. And then in Psalm 55, 22, it says, give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. So then what does that have to do with stop stealing? How many times, I can only speak for myself, because I would probably uh, not have enough fingers to count. Have I given God something and then stolen it right back? Like, God, I'm going to give it to you, but then I'm going to check on you to see how the progress is coming. God, what are you doing with that problem I gave you? What are you doing with that situation that I gave you? If I could just check in with you and get a status report, that would be great. I don't recall the Holy Spirit ever giving me a status report. He's never been moved by my request for updates, but you need to understand that God is working diligently in the background so that your life can be a beautiful tapestry that everybody sees. But for anybody in here, if you needlepoint, for some of you women, or if you used to do, I used to do count it cross stitch where I would do uh, all these embroidery pieces. And if you ever flipped a piece of embroidery over, you would see that the lines crisscross and they go all over the place. But the side that the people see is beautiful. And so God orchestrates your life to where in the background all kinds of things are moving, but everything people see is a beautiful masterpiece, which should be your life. 
because you are living your life intentionally. God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you have on your mind for me? I need to ask him first thing in the morning. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Thank you so much that my sleep was just glorious. I love to sleep, y'all. And my sleep is beautiful. I thank the Lord that I slept all snugly in the covers and I just felt like the Holy Spirit was there. The angels were hanging out. Somebody was singing in the background and it was just me just snuggled up like a baby. That's how beautiful your life can be when you live intentionally. Why? Because I don't stress. I protect my peace. When there's an opportunity to stress, you can ask my daughter. There's all types of opportunities to stress. But when an opportunity comes, I don't sign for the package. I'm like, oh, no, you have the wrong address. Mm -mm. We don't accept stress here. No, thank you. Mm -mm. And the enemy is trying to talk to me and tell me, you have this bill, you have this bill, you have that. I'm like, shut up. Shut up. Stop talking to me. I don't talk to you. I don't have conversations with you. I don't speak devil. So I can't talk to you. I can't indulge you. But he loves to try to stir up a conversation with you. You just got to be able to shut him down and be like, mm-mm, mm-mm. And every now and then, if you accidentally start a conversation with the enemy, the Holy Spirit will be like, who are you talking to? Nobody. Don't talk to somebody who's known for being a liar. Amen? It sounds foolish if you would do it in real life. Like, who are you talking to? Oh, this person who's known to be a liar. That's all they do is they lie, they accuse. Why are you talking to them? They started talking to me. Don't talk back. And so when I have opportunities to be stressed, I'm like, the things that I can control and change, I do. And the things that I can't, I just leave it up to the Holy Spirit. He is wise enough to let me know if I need to participate. So what do I do? I give my worries and my cares to him. If you get a bad report from the doctor or if you're looking at your bank account and you're saying, you know, there's more outcome than there is income, ask the Lord for that creative idea. The first thing you need to do is make sure that you're tithing and don't let the enemy have legal right to touch your stuff and to steal from you. I'm not giving the enemy any extra space. He hogs in on enough space on his own when he's squatting on my territory and I got to evict him or I got to kick him out or I got to get rid of him. But the last thing I want to do is give something to the Lord and then steal it back. That's the last thing I want to do. Why? God is doing better with it than I ever could. So when I cast it on him, I need to stop stealing and let him take care of it. I don't know how, but I know who. Amen. Only a few of you in the room uh, probably have the degree or the education to understand how my very complicated universal remote control works. I don't know how it works. And if I took it apart, I still wouldn't know how it works. But all I know is that when I point it at the television, it works. All I know about Jesus, I don't know how it all works. I just know who. And I know that when I raise my arms to him and when I call upon his name, I know it works. Communicating with him works. Talking to him works. Praying with him works. Allowing him to order my steps works. Choosing to live intentionally works. Amen. Number two, for all you men, I didn't leave you out. The best e defense is a good offense. The best defense is a good, it's a good offense. You know, when a storm comes, that might be a little bit late for you to start installing stormproof windows. Not that it won't be a little effective, but it won't be as effective had, had you done it before the storm came. The Bible talks about that it rains on the good and the, the evil alike. So there's going to be storms. There's going to be challenges. And when you got in the Jesus line, you're on a whole nother level because the enemy is out for you. But he's already defeated, so he can't really touch you. All he can do is deliver lies. And if you co-sign on the lies, then his lies become your truth. And then that truth exceeds itself and tries to rise above the knowledge of the truth. The truth is that God is the one true God, the I am. Jesus Christ was resurrected rose from the grave. All power was risen with him, that the power that raised him from the dead is the same power that resides in you, that he promised to give you the Holy Spirit, your comforter, your encourager, your confidant, your guide, your help in present time. So if you have all of that working for you on the offense, then you don't have to always play defense. Defense is when the enemy hits you and then you're trying to hit back or respond to what he's doing. But before the enemy shows up, I get in my word. I get in my time of prayer so that even when the enemy comes, I'm like, ah, 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 ah. You haven't been reading your word. Because then I can tell him I'm the head and not the tail. So you can't tell me that I'm not enough because my father already said that I'm enough. Well, you know, you're too far for the Lord to find you. You know, you're depressed, you're oppressed, you got too many bills, you got this, you got that. Uh, 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 uh. 
you must not have been reading your word. Because the Bible says, where can I make my bed that he will not find me? The highest heights, he's there. The lowest depths, he's there. I don't know about you, but I had some self-imposed and other-imposed depths that I went to. But the Lord's hand rescued me and picked me up and taught me how to play offense instead of defense. He taught me how to read the word and put my name in the word. He taught me that I was bought with a price and that I'm precious and that I'm invaluable. So I shouldn't sell myself at a discount because of the enemy's agenda. I don't serve the enemy's agenda. I serve the agenda of the most high God. Amen. So what does it tell you to do with the best defense? It tells you to stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Stand firm. Tell your neighbor, stand firm. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Amen? You don't even need a lot of faith, right? A little faith moves mountains. You remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. It just means hardships. We are persecuted by the enemy. You may have some hardships caused by someone else. I have a girlfriend who has uh, a nonprofit organization called DV Unveiled, and, and she is just a wonderful overcomer and survivor of domestic violence. She was shot three times less than three years ago, and she's already sharing her story. She's already talking about the goodness of God. She's already making manifest his glory, where the word says that I will, li I will live and I shall not die. And so there was someone sent on assignment to kill her, but the Holy Spirit made sure that he moved her out of the way at the right time. Amen. And I don't know if you've had any situations that were that extreme, but what I'm telling you is to be alert. You don't know what other people's stories are. And so when you live intentionally and you can be a gift of Jesus into someone else's life, you may be ministering to a person who is about to take their life. That's a good offense instead of a good defense. It's the one time that it's okay to curse. How many of you when, you, when you were little kids, it was fun to curse? Ain't nobody raising a hand but me, just me. It's all right. That's all right. That's all right. I had fun cursing. I had fun because I had lots of adults in my world that could tell me how to put together words that you, probably most of y'all ain't even thought of. Like, a, it was just like, it was just like magnificent, just gunfight, just cuss words, cuss words, cuss words, curse. And so I was like, okay, Lord, how do I use this for your glory? He said, curse the things that were spoken over you that don't align with me. Amen? Think about the things that maybe a teacher has spoken over you, maybe a family member has spoken over you. Accidentally, when family does it, I don't think it's with malicious intent. Just sometimes we're joking or we're being matter of fact, but the power of life and death is in the tongue. And so when you speak a word, that word continues to live. It lives on the vibrations and sound waves. And so it's okay to curse when you're putting to death the words that were spoken over you that don't line up with what God has for you or who God says that you are. You may be in here listening and you're thinking, I'm not good at math, or I'm not good at science, or I'm not good at speaking, or I'm not good uh, at writing. As soon as you hear that, you need to put those words to death and put them under the blood. I put these words under the blood of Jesus. Why? Because you were made in his likeness and image, and I don't remember reading anything that he really could not do. I didn't read that. And so if the power that raised him from the dead resides in you, in me, then imagine the great things that we can do and can still do if we are living intentionally. If we are choosing our responses instead of reacting, choose to respond with the word. Curse the words that were spoken over you. Curse the actions that were done to you that didn't line up with the word. And then you release the word. If you don't know what to release, open your word. Get Dr. Maureen, my spiritual mother, my mentor, get her power confession book and just read the confessions and put your name in it so that you can see how blessed you really are who God called you to be. Spend some time with the Holy Spirit and ask him, Lord, what did you have on your mind when you allowed me to be born for such a time as this? What do you want me to accomplish for your glory and to build your kingdom? The last thing I want to tell you to do is just to build intimacy and build relationship with the Lord. Amen. How many of you are married in the house? Amen. I will be in the future. Praise God. But I'm going to tell you for the ones who are married, do you talk to your spouse every day? I mean, I'm just asking. I'm not married. I talk to the Holy Spirit every day. Do you talk to your spouse or just about every day? I hope it's every day. So can you imagine not having a good, healthy, solid relationship with somebody that you don't talk to? 
But yet we can entreat the Lord. We can ask of the Lord. We can inquire of the Lord. But we ask when we need him. When he just wants relationship. Before I get up in the morning, sometimes the Lord will wake me up. I was like, why am I up? Because I normally get up around 8, and of late I've been, my eyes popping open at like 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. And I was like, Lord, is somebody, you know, in trouble? Am I supposed to pray for someone? Am I on assignment? And he's like, no, I just wanted to talk. And I was like, you want to talk to me? I was like, what do you want to talk about? This is so exciting. And I want to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. And he may tell me, look for an assignment today. Okay, where, where, where? And then I'm like a little kid. Where, where, where's the assignment? Where's the assignment? Tell me, tell me. And he won't tell me. He's just like, just look out for the assignment. He's like, have I told you that you're beautiful? Yeah, you tell me that every day. I don't always feel beautiful. He's like, but you are because you were created in my likeness and in my image. And at the end of of my making, I said, it's good. He said, so you're good. And I said, well, I don't feel good. He's like, trust me, I created you. And I know you're good because I know what I created. Building relationship and building intimacy with the Holy Spirit and with the Lord, that should be one of the things that we endeavor to do. When you're married, don't you continue to get new things revealed to you on a regular basis? Even when you've been married, Dr. Tom and Dr. Maureen have been married for 50 years, and she'll still tell me about things that she discovers or learns, because as you grow and you get closer to the Lord, you begin to change. And so it's always an adventure getting to know your spouse because your spouse is continuing to change. And as we continue to change, we become more and more and more like Jesus. And I want to get to know people who are getting more and more and more like Jesus. I want to talk to him. I want to know what's on his mind for me. I want to know who does he want me to pray for this week. I have my family that I pray for. I pray for the church family. I pray for the women's ministry that I'm over. But God has a list of people that he'll tell me to pray for. And every now and then he'll put a name in my mind and in my heart that I'm supposed to pray for. There was a... um, A young man, we did an intervention. He is a friend of a friend that goes to church here, and he was actually contemplating taking his life just because of some things that had happened in his life. And this is a kid. He's in his young 20s. And I got called to go over and be part of the intervention. And when I went there, you could just sense the spirit of heaviness in the room. And it was just due to some friends and some other things, just some hurts. Can we just say there was just some hurts? Sometimes we go through some hurts and we forget that we have a high priest who understands us in every single thing that we go through. There's no hurt that he doesn't understand. There's no annoyance. There's no frustration. He understands all of it because he was 100% God and 100% man. And so as I began to talk to this young man just about him being hurt and feeling rejected and feeling abandoned, I said, you know, your life is this beautiful gift. And the reason that I feel like I have a special place for people who contemplate suicide is because I've contemplated it, planned it. Praise God, I didn't carry it out because I would not be in front of you today. She wouldn't be in front of you today. My son wouldn't be in front of you today. It was, and I will declare this so everyone on YouTube can hear me, it was the most foolish and most selfish decision that I was about to make. I was about to allow the enemy to cause me to apply a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And when you just continue to live long enough, you do realize and see that it really does get better, that the enemy is just a temporary distraction. But when you're young, it feels like a huge crisis that you can't get over and you may feel hopeless or you may feel helpless. And that's when you need to push into the Holy Spirit even more. And I told this young man, I said, it's very selfish of you to want to make this choice. Because I know for some people, you know, if you're doing interventions, you know, you want to be gentle with the person. And okay, if that's your ministry, that's not how God built me. I'm gentle sometimes. But I'm very exacting when it comes to the word of God and my relationship with the Lord, because I understand what it feels like to be hopeless and helpless. And sometimes you got to shine a bright light into that dark place to get that person to see that there is a great light within them. So if I can shine a light that connects with the light that's really in them, because God put it there, it's just been hidden over darkness and trash and rejection and betrayal and hurt and offense. If I can shine a bright light that will touch that bright light within them, that bright light will come out of them. And so as I began to talk to him, I said, you're going to leave all the people in this room to deal with the fallout of you taking your own life. That's selfish. 
That's selfish. How are you going to solve a problem by being gone? You don't want to meet your spouse. You don't want to meet your children. You don't want to grow old. There's some movies that's going to come out you might want to see, and you ain't even going to be here. You know, and he laughed about that. And I looked at his mother, and I said, you know what I will not do? I will not help your mother plan your memorial. If anything happens to you, I'm not, I'm not helping her because that's not how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to celebrate her at the end of her days, not her lay you to rest. So I can't celebrate that. Now, in my heart of hearts, and I did tell him, I said, if you make this decision, I do believe that the Lord will give you a moment to repent and to realize this decision so that you have an opportunity to go home and be with the Lord. And I know a lot of belief systems believe if you take your life, you're going straight to hell. But who would God be if he wasn't gracious and merciful enough to offer even that person that one last opportunity? We don't know what happens at the moment of death, but I cannot believe that our father would turn his back on a child because the child was deceived and walked in a foolish decision. And so I prayed for that young man, and when I prayed for that young man, the Holy Spirit just began to pour and to speak about him as an adult and the things that he would do and the things that he would see. And he began to cry, and I began to quote Psalm 139 over him and told him how he was knit in his mother's womb and that when Jesus knits, he knits magnificently, that he knits, he knits fingers and toes and, and eyes and heart and lungs and how your organs work all by themselves to do what they need to do without you putting any effort in it. You don't tell your colon to work. You don't tell your intestines to work. You don't tell your heart to beat. But when God spoke and when he breathed life into man back in Genesis, that same life that he breathed into man and then gave us the ability to recreate after ourselves, that breath is still breathing. And then the anointing came in the room and I felt that thing break and I saw light in his eyes. I said, let me help you, young man of God. The people who have brought you to this place of hopelessness, they were created just like you. They had the same exit channel that you had to get here. They were either born from a womb or a C-section. Those are the only two ways to get here. So why would you let someone else who went through the same process as you did tell you who you are? You get your definition from the most high God. Let him tell you who he designed you to be. Let him tell you who he called you to be. And then the life that he gave you, what you do with it becomes your life, your gift back to him. And that's what it means to live intentionally. Lord, the life that you gave me, I want to give it back to you, shining magnificently for you. I want to be the lighthouse on a hill that people see the light and they're attracted to the light. And they're like, what's different about you? What is it? It is the light of the Lord. And if you allow me, I will introduce you to him. We can meet him in a parking lot. We can meet him at a Circle K. We can meet him at a QT, a Walmart, a Target. I can't even tell you how many people I've asked, can I pray for you? And we stand in the middle of the aisle at Walmart. And it looks crazy, but you know what? Nobody walks up and down that aisle the whole time I'm praying because God creates it as a holy space where he is trying to minister to someone, where he is trying to break bondages and set captives free. And so when you begin praying, you begin praying in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because you have spent intimate time with the Lord. So the Lord can send you on assignment. And when you go on assignment, the Lord will call that a holy place and he will make sure nobody interrupts you, nobody comes around and you get to do what God has assigned you to do. But it's about building that intimacy and that relationship with the Lord so that when he tells you to go on assignment, you can not only listen, but you're equipped and ready to go. Ephesians 1.17 says, For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him. My daughter, uh, her best friend, uh, had a scripture that she said just jumped out at her because she just graduated college and she's trying to figure out what to do next. And the scripture that ministered to her, I wanted to share with you is Psalm 116 too. It says, because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Prayer is communication with the Lord. And you should see your father bending down to listen. You see little kids, I, I run children's church. And so there are a couple of little kids who have to come and find me and tell me hello on Sunday morning. No matter where they are in the church, they look for me. One, her name is Gracie. Gracie has to come and just hug me. And she's, Pastor, Pastor Dion. 
And I love how she says my name. But when I read that scripture, what I thought about is every time she runs to me across the foyer, I bend down to get to her. And then she hugs me and I embrace her and I hug her and I said, your hugs are the best. She goes, yours too. And so imagine if we're praying and communicating with our father. Every time we run to him, he bends down to listen. And he hugs you and he tells you that your hugs are the best. And you can tell him, no, daddy, your hugs are the best. And you know what I thought about that little child named Grace? Is that every Sunday, hear me well, people of God, I am embraced by grace. Amen. Only the Holy Spirit could do that. That this child that comes to say hello to me, her name is Grace. And the Holy Spirit just reminded me, every time I send her, see me. Amen. Every time the Lord sends you, people should see him. Live intentionally. Amen. If you got something out of that, give the Lord a hand of praise.